So, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Howard Dyer. Uh, I'm a national instructor with the British Black Club, and I'm based in sunny Pembrokeshire, although it's not too sunny today. This evening's uh, webinar was a request that was put in on engines and hull designs. So, what we're going to be looking at this evening is is very much broad brush information. It's not designed to make you an expert. Uh, it's designed to basically whet your appetite. For more information and you know if you need further information then you advise to seek it elsewhere this is not designed to make you an expert so what we're going to look at this evening well we're going to look at hull types and basic designs we're going to look at some common engine configurations Outboard engines in a little more detail. The differences between two stroke and four stroke and some pros and cons of each. We're going to look at setting up an engine on a boat. We're going to look at basic fault finding. And finally, we're going to look at emergency starting. So moving on. So we've got Hull types and basic designs. Uh, the most basic of all is the soft inflatable boat or the SIB. So what does a soft inflatable boat looks like? It looks like, well, it looks like that. And it's got a number of, uh, of characteristics. It's got no solid hull. It's made from a series of inflatable cells. And if you look on there, you can just see black dots on the yellow hull and that is the filling point for each cell. Uh, they have a slatted or removable wooden floor. And they have a rigid transom to carry an outboard engine. Uh, usually they have an inflatable keel um, which provides a, a sort of a shallow V in the water and that's to help improve directional stability. They can be deflated and rolled up for transport. They don't actually need a trailer. And because they've got very low freeboard, so the actual amount of, of um, sorry, a very low draft, the amount of boat that's under the water is quite little. So they can operate in very shallow water. And because they're light, they can be manhandled between a couple of you and launching areas that slip ones. Flip side of that is because they're so light, uh, they need some weight in the bow to keep the bow down. Um, and if you ever see the RMLI D class out and about, you'll see that usually some poor soul has the unenviable job of kneeling up in the bows to keep the thing flat in the water. They are a very seaworthy boat, but they can be incredibly uncomfortable in rough seas. And because of the size of the transom, they tend to be a little more limited in the horsepower rating uh, that you have on them. A couple of other points on them. Um, you've got the, the tubes themselves, or sponsons as you wish to call them. Uh, they generally get inflated to around about three and a half pounds per square inch. Don't overinflate them uh, because they have battles between the different um, sections of the sponson. And if you overinflate them, it can damage them. Uh, there will be a maximum power rating on the transom that will dictate the maximum size of engine that the hull can take. Don't exceed it. And, you know, they have a tendency to scout sideways in, in uh, a C. So when you're putting power on and turning the engine, they tend to not head bow on, but they tend to sort of skip sideways. But as I said, they're a very, uh, very seaworthy vessel. So moving on from the soft inflatable boat, we've got the rigid inflatable boat. An example you can see there. So the rigid inflatable boat or rib. Now this is actually 
It was developed from the soft inflatable boat in the 1960s in a place called Alfred Major in South Wales at the Atlantic College there. And that was done in conjunction with the RNLI. Now, they have a solid keel, which is usually uh, glass reinforced plastic or GRP. Not necessarily, they can be made of other materials. So, for example, you can have a Kevlar weave in there instead of glass. Uh, and you can even have an aluminium hull. On top of that, you've got a fixed solid deck, again, usually made of GRP, although other materials are available, for example, aluminium again. And the hull is fitted with collar made from inflatable cells. So basically, one way of looking at it is it's a speedboat with a soft inflatable boat glued on top of it. They usually need a trailer for transport. Again, you've got a rigid transom on the, uh, the stern of the vessel to carry the outboard engine. And unless they're very small, they usually need the slipway to be launched. Uh, the hull itself is usually hollow, but sometimes can have underfloor fuel tanks. And again, uh, maximum power rating will be identified on the transom plates. And they're generally inflated to a slightly lower pressure than soft inflatable boats. So around about 2 PSI is not unusual. However, that does vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. So you need to check with your own uh, boat manufacturer. Okay, so the rigid inflatable boat itself then diversify slightly. So you've got deep V hull. So why would you want a deep V hull? Well, it's got a couple of uh, good characteristics and that is it will cut through waves more easily. However, flip side of that is you've got additional hull in the water, so you've got additional drag. So to get a deep V hull, hull up on the plane, you need a uh, greater engine power to start planing. Positive side of that is they're going to be more comfortable, especially in rough seas, because they'll cut through the water as opposed to slamming over it. But flip side of that is because of the additional drag in the water, they tend to be slower for the same power outboard. So if you had a deep V hull and you put a 40 horsepower on it, it would be slower than a shallow V hull with the same size engine. So again, as I just said, shallow V hull, there's less drag in the water, it requires less engine power to start planing. And because of that, it will plane at a lower speed. However, flip side of that is it tends to be quite an uncomfortable ride because instead of cutting through the waves, it slams and bounces over it. But they can be faster for the equivalent engine power and propeller. And because they've got less drag in the water, then like for like, they tend to give slightly better fuel um, economy. So that sort of illustrates a little bit better the differences between the two. So you think, well, you know, hang on a minute, why can't we have the best of both worlds? And the answer to that is, yeah, you can. So what's been developed on more modern hull designs is you've got a compromise, different characteristics. So what you have is on a modern all round rib hull, you have a deep V at the bow, which allows you to cut through the water, and then that flattens out to a broad planing pad on the stern. So once the boat is up, it'll plane easier, but you get the, the, the almost the best of both worlds. So next we'll move on to some common engine configurations. So the first thing we've got is single outboard engine, then twin or more outboard engines, but we'll consider just a twin out, uh, setup in this case. Then we'll look at stern drive and finally jet drive. So the single outboard engine.
I'm sure you've seen them all by now. So, single outboard, make it to the transom of uh, a boat. Usually a rigid inflatable. And it's the most popular arrangement you tend to see out there. There can be two methods of control. You can either have a console you sit on with a steering wheel and throttle, or you have a tiller that you sit adjacent to the transom and steer it that way. Um, tiller controls only tend to be up to around about the 40 horsepower. Um, the reason being after that, it gets very tiring quite quickly to drive anything bigger than that. Uh, with a tiller control. So, why are they popular? Well, they got a number of pros. They're lighter. There's less capital investment. Engines are very expensive. So, if you're only buying one, you're only spending one substantial amount of money instead of two or more. Faster for the equivalent power. That seems a bit strange. So, what do I mean by that? And what I'm saying is, if you had a 90 horsepower single outboard or two 45s, then the single 90 would be faster. Why is that? Well, the reason is it's a number of issues. You've got the drag in the water and you've got the, the prop wash from the, the two engines. So single light for light will be faster than twins. Because there's only one engine, you've got one set of servicing costs one set of batteries, one set of controls, one set of fuel lines, but flip side of it is you've got no redundancy. So if the engine breaks down, you're stuck. And there will be a limit on the power output. So as incredible as it sounds, I think the largest single outboard engine you can get is something like a 627 horsepower. Uh, if for whatever reason you wanted to go more than 627 horsepower, you need more than one engine. Uh, but the limit that you can put on the boat is what's on the maker's plate, and that will both be horsepower and weight. So moving on, we've got the Double outboard engine. So, double outboard engine, again, transom mounted. In this case, they are predominantly only console controlled because you've got the issue of two sets of throttles, steering linkages, and so forth. So, the pros that go with that are that you've got redundancy. So, if one engine breaks down, you've got to get out of jail free, provided you've sized the engines appropriately. So your boat should be able to play on one engine alone. More power possible. So in this case, uh, if you look at the photograph there, they've got two 350s, that's 700 horsepower on the stern of the boat. Um, obviously, that would be unachievable with a single engine. But then there are a number of flip sides to that, and that is it's heavier for the equivalent power. So if you had two 200s, they're going to weigh more than one 400. It's slower for the equivalent power. You've got more in the water. There's more drag. They're less economical um, because running two engines is, is about 30% um, less efficient than running one single. Again, it's more investment if you consider that a typical outboard engine costs around about, let's call it £10,000. You're buying one, you're spending £10,000. You're buying two, you're spending £20,000. It's more complex. You have to have um, independent systems throughout, or effectively you are running the risk of losing your redundancy. So you need twin battery systems, twin control systems, twin fuel systems, twin throttles. And it's more expensive servicing because you've got two of everything. And again, consider the transom weight because in this case, it's probably going to work out more heavy than the power that you're looking at. Okay, so moving on, we're looking at stern drives next. So the stern drive, 
It's a transom mounted drive, which you can see in, in the silver for the left of the photograph, and an inboard engine, which is generally uh, a marinized equivalent to an automotive engine. So they're console controlled. You can see there the, uh, the looking at the stern view. They're console controlled. It steers like an outboard. It's got throttles like an outboard. Occasionally you have two throttles, one for forward and the stern and the other one for engine speed, or it can be combined like a normal um, outboard. They have the benefit they can be raised, trimmed, again, like an outboard engine. And they're common on large original inflatables. So, you know, they're a serious bit of kit. They've got some good pros. Uh, it's possible for big power outputs. You're removing the transom weight, so you're not hanging all this on the stern of the vessel. Uh, you're helping to balance it slightly better. And they're quite common to be diesel fuel. So again, you've got the opportunity there for economy, or if the vessel is a commercial vessel, it's going to run on red diesel. Um, but some cons to that are that it, they're quite complex. You, It's fair to say you almost get the worst of both worlds because you've got the complexity of an inboard engine with um, the complexity of an outboard stern leg. And they are invariably expensive. A lot of things that people don't like with them is the fact that the engine takes up deck space. So that, that engine is sat inboard of a transom and is generally in a large glass fiber box, which obviously takes up deck space that could um, be taken up with kit or people. Okay, so moving on. We've got the jet drum. Now, in this case, what you've got is an inboard engine uh, and a transom mounted nozzle. So, in this case, what you'll see is you've got an inlet at the bottom of the keel. The water gets pulled in, gets put through an impeller, a rotor, and gets directed out the back of the vessel as a jet. That jet is steerable, and that's what gives you the control. So it's effectively like a big jet bike. And they are, again, console controlled. So you can see uh, the, the jet drive at the, the stern of that vessel there. And again, you've got some idea of how much space gets taken up with the, the engine being on board. So they've got uh, a couple of pros, and that is they're safer. There's no propeller. so. Uh, you don't have to worry about people getting hit with a propeller because there isn't one. That also makes them good for use in shallow waters. And they do have fast acceleration and deceleration. Uh, especially if you are operating a stern on this. I'll come on to your stern in a moment because that's also a con. So, on the downside of jet uh, jet drive boats, uh, they've got poor efficiency. They've got 50% reduction in economy. They've got very poor low speed control. And if you ever tried uh, helming one, they make um, entertaining vessels trying to come alongside at low speeds when there's a lot of other boat traffic about. And they are difficult to control the stern. If you look at the photograph of the stern of the boat there, you can see the um, you see the sort of white T piece. Now that's a bucket that drops down over the jet to steer the jet. And to go astern, it basically reverses the jet wash. So it, it, it brings it back towards the bow. And it, they're not particularly good astern. And then finally, a bit of a strange one, they can't be trimmed. And um, you can have um, hydroplanes that can be adjusted on them, but the the trim of the boat itself can't be controlled by raising or lowering the drive system as you get with a stern drive and um, an outboard engine. And again, same concern as you get with a stern drive. Oh, sorry. 
The engine takes up deck space. So we're going to look a little bit more now at outboard engines. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a simplistic outboard engine layout and basically explain how an outboard engine works. So in the first case, fuel burns in the cylinder, driving the piston up and down. So the expanding gas from the combustion drives the piston back and forth in the cylinder. The piston is connected via a con rod to the crank. So as the piston rod goes up and down, it turns the crankshaft, turning the reciprocating motion into rotary. Rotary action then gets driven down the crankshaft, turning the main shaft, running down the spine of the motor, where it goes through a 90 degree um, gearbox, where it goes from being a vertical spinning motion into horizontal. And then that drives the prop and pushes the boat through the water. So nice and simplistic, nothing to it. <laughs> so looking at a little bit more complexity, what we basically do is we split the engine into three components. You've got the power head, midsection, and the lower leg. Um, we look at that as a cutaway. Then you think, oh, that's the stuff of nightmares. So what we'll do is we'll take it a section at a time and we'll look at the individual components. Obviously, these will vary depending on manufacturer and type of engine, but the it's approximately the same throughout. So, looking at the power head. So you've got a number of items in there. You'll have the power head is obviously, as it says, producing power. You'll have an electrical system that either charges your batteries or provides power to the ignition system. You've got a fuel system that supplies fuel into the cylinders and allows it to get burnt, turning the reciprocating motion into the rotary. You'll have an ignition system that provides the spark. So in the case of diesel engine, uh, we'll inject fuel. And then you've got the con rods and the crankshaft, which turns this reciprocating motion of the pistons into a rotary motion. Somewhere on the um, power head as well, you'll have a cooling telltale, which you need to keep an eye on for to make sure that the engine is, is being cooled. They tend to be towards the rear of the engine to one side, uh, where they can be seen. So that's what one looks like without the cover on. So moving down to the midsection of the leg. So in this case, this is to do with power transmission. So you've generated the power in the power head. Now you need to get it down the leg to uh, the gearbox in the lower leg. So what else have you got in the midsection? Well, you've got a method of attaching it to the boat because there's no point having this unless you can actually use the power that it's producing. You'll have a steering hub that allows you to turn the engine. You've got the drive shaft that runs from the power head and the crankshaft down through the leg. You'll have the exhaust system, getting rid of the spent gases from combustion. And you'll have some method of trim adjustment, be it um, electrically driven hydraulic pumps or a manual system with gas rams. There will be something on the engine that allows you to adjust the trim of it to help you um, help the boat performance. You'll also have the gear linkage, uh, selection linkage that runs through the midsection to the, uh, the top of the engine where you then select the gear. And I've in the case of this one, I've included it in the midsection, but sometimes it's in the lower leg. You'll have the water pump. Uh, what the water pump is, it's um, effectively a, a rubber spider of the soft set in a in a chamber and it draws water in through the bottom of the leg 
and then pushes it out, pressurizes it, pushes it out, so it can go around the power head to cool the engine. And that's what one looks like with the covers on. So, moving on to the last part of the engine, the lower leg. So, this will have a number of um, features. You'll have the cavitation plate, which is to prevent from air from being drawn into the propeller and the propeller cavitating, so it aids efficiency. You'll have sacrificial anodes, which we'll come on to in a little moment. Um, this particular one fulfilled two purposes, which we'll touch on in a, in a bit. You have a gearbox. What you don't have is a clutch. So if you see someone helming the boat and they're you know, gently feathering it into gear and you hear that horrible rattling crunch, you're, they're not doing the engine any favours because they're not smoothly riding the clutch. They're running gears over each other. So in this case, it's plunk into gear smoothly and then allow the engine to pick up. And what you've got there is you've got the spinning shaft rotating and you've got a selector fork that brings the bevel gears forward or back and that dictates whether the prop runs forwards or backwards so whether you go forwards or stern. If you're having difficulty selecting a gear in either direction it's generally because there's stretch or there's poor adjustment in one of the cables so the selector isn't moving fully to one position or the other. So you'll have a propeller through the propeller comes the exhaust, which is why they're so noisy out of the water and so relatively quiet in the water. You'll have a water intake, if not here, somewhere on the lower leg to allow the water pump to draw the water in to cool the power head. And you'll have a skeg to provide some stability. And again, that's what it looks like in the flash. Okay, so we've talked about two stroke and we've sort of talked a little bit about four strokes. So what's the difference? Well, what I'll do now is I'll show you an animation of the two engines. Now, if we look at the two stroke, which is on the left hand side first, and if you look at that, you'll see that for every revolution, you get a power stroke, you'll get fuel burning. If you look at the four stroke, cycle on the right hand side you only get a power stroke every two revolutions every 720 degrees so the two stroke on the left hand side you get the blue charge being brought in through the carburetor through a series of reed valves into the bottom end of the engine once the piston starts to descend that reed valve closes. It's, uh, it's not geared in any way the valve, it's series just a, a, a plastic plate or a very thin metal plate. So it pulls open as the pressure reduces and then closes as the pressure increases. Then as the piston starts to drop, you see the blue charge come up around the side of the piston and it will go through a port in the cylinder into the cylinder itself. As the piston comes up, it closes the port off, compresses the fuel air mix, and the spark plug ignites it. Drives the piston down. By driving it down, you're bringing the fresh charge in. The spent exhaust gases go out of the uh, exhaust, and the whole system repeats again. So the expanding exhaust gas on a two-stroke actually creates a, a pressure differential that pulls the fresh charge in from the crank of the engine. This is why uh, two-strokes are not as efficient as four-strokes because invariably you get a little bit of unburnt fuel gets wasted on that um, on that scavenge cycle of the exhaust gases going on. 
as you notice, apart from the reed valve, there are no mechanical valves, there's no mechanical drive train managing the valves, so the engines themselves are a lot simpler. If we compare that with the four stroke on the right hand side, then what you've got is the piston comes down, says in a minute. This thing comes down, valve opens, and in that valve, and it pulls the fresh charge in, the blue charge. This thing goes to the bottom dead center, comes up, compresses that charge, and the charge gets ignited by a spark. You get a power stroke, pushes the piston back down, and as the piston comes back up, an exhaust valve opens, and the piston rises back up, it expels the spent gas into the exhaust system. A two-stroke has no internal lubrication system. It relies on a total loss lubrication system. That's either oil is injected into the um, piston or the carburetors, or it's mixed into the fuel or the pre-mix. A four-stroke engine has an internal lubrication system. So you'll have a sump, uh, a dipstick, all the stuff that you tend to find on a car engine. So that's how they basically work. What's the benefits? Well, two stroke, got a number of pros. They tend to be lighter. They tend to be a lot quicker accelerating and they tend to be cheaper because they're more simple. They've also been around for a, a while. Um, they, because there are less moving parts, less components, they're easier to repair. Uh, because they've been around for a, a good number of years, there's quite a strong used market for sales on them. Because of that, you can get used parts readily. And it's a simple design, so there's less to go wrong. Having said that, they do have a number of cons. They are more polluting because of the nature of the beast is pulling a fresh charge in and it's part of that charge is being used to get the exhaust out. So they are more polluting. There's a reoccurring cost of oil. Um, you have to put two stroke oil either into your two stroke tank or into your fuel. You've got no choice in the matter. And you've got to do that every time you go out. Uh, they tend to be a lot smokier. Some people don't like the smell of them. They tend not to uh, idle on tickover as easily. Uh, they tend to have a rough idle. And if they kept hanging about without much use, the carburetors can gum up, fuel evaporate, oil left in there, and you get issues with the carbs on that. They are noisier. And perhaps what's going to cause the biggest problem with two strokes in the future is that uh, to comply with emissions regulations, they have to make them more complex. So it's either things like fuel injection or in some cases um, boosting. So what that's finding there is that's making the simple design less simple and in turn more expensive. So that's two strokes, four strokes. They're quiet. You fire them up, they sit there, boom, 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 loving quiet. They're less polluted because it's future technology and future production and research is aimed at it. They're sort of becoming a lot more future proof. As I said earlier, you don't need to mix the oil with the fuel. Uh, they're great for trolling. So if you want to put around at slow speeds, either in and out of Estuary bays or trying to pick up wrecks, whatever, they're fantastic for that. Two strokes tend to oil the plugs a little more, and every now and again, you've got to give them a burst to clear the excess oil off. They tend to have good fuel economy, and the majority of them are fuel injected, and they are very good on fuel economy. They're reliable, and they will tick over smoothly. So they'll sit there all day long, popping along quite happily. Flip side of that, well, because they're more complex, there's more in them, they're heavier. So uh, a 90 horse two stroke will be significantly lighter than a 90 horse four stroke. 
They also tend to be bigger. The power heads are larger on them and the cowling because there's more to get in. They're more expensive to buy as a capital item, so your upfront costs are more expensive. And often they're more expensive to service or repair. And they may not accelerate as fast. Uh, one point is if you've got a, a full stroke engine you're taking off, then to transport it you have to store it upright or what will happen is it will pull its some oil into the uh, into the cylinder and then it's going to smoke or be difficult to start. And there's more parts, so there's more possible that can go wrong with them. Okay. Um, one thing to consider with four strokes is because of the additional weight, you might find that you reach the limit of the transom on weight before you get to the limit of horsepower. Okay, so next we're going to look at setting up the engine. So first thing you need to consider is what size engine do I need? And I don't mean what horsepower. Is it a standard leg? Is it a long leg? And that would be dictated to by the height of your transom, as, the, as uh, shown there. Next consideration is, are you running it in fresh or salt water? Now, what you can see there is a number of indications of places for anodes. You have to have anodes in the engines because uh, the similar metals will cause corrosion. So the more um, active metal will dissolve in preference to less active metal. Uh, a good example of this is if someone's rebuilt their engine and they've used uh, copper slip, which is a mixture of copper and lead, that's quite low on the reactivity table and they might find that it actually causes more corrosion on their engine as they go along. So on the reactivity table, further apart, uh, the, the, the less similar the metals, the faster they'll corrode. So you need to be aware of where you're using it and select your anodes accordingly. How big a propeller do you need? Well, if the engine is overcropped, so the propeller is too big for it, it won't reach maximum RPM and conversely, you won't get maximum power. However, if it's underpropped and the engine easily uh, reaches its maximum RPM, then you're not getting the most push out of the propeller, if you want a better phrase. Um, if you make the prop bigger diameter, then it will over, it will increase the prop in the engine. If you make it smaller, it will reduce the prop in. And if you increase the pitch, so the pitch is, if you imagine, if you drew a corkscrew of the, of the path of the propeller through the water, the pitch is how far it goes in one complete revolution, as opposed to diameter is the distance from the center of the prop to the outer edge of the following two. So increasing the pitch will decrease the revs and vice versa. So what you can do is you can play a number of tunes there with prop diameter and prop pitch to get the optimum. However, I appreciate that that is an expensive game. So if you want better acceleration, a rough rule of thumb is reduce the diameter of the propeller and increase the pitch by roughly the same amount. Okay. Again, that's assuming that your uh, prop is, is adequately sized. Okay, so setting up the engine. Next thing I want to look at is offset and bias. So your propeller rotation will push your boat to port or starboard, depending on which way your engine rotates. This isn't such an issue in twin engines, provided one rotates clockwise and the other one rotates anti-clockwise. If they both rotate the same way, you've got the same issue. So what you've got is, if you cast your mind back to the uh, display earlier with the anode, you've got a trim tab anode. And what you need to do is slacken off the bolt in the center of it, and there will be a series of markings on there that allows you to uh, adjust that offset in a number of degrees and you turn it in the direction that the boat is pulling. And what that does is counteract the effect of the, the water, the effect of the engine in the prop, and so it helps to, to uh, 
straighten the bolt up and reduce the amount of pull it sees. Okay, so we've got the bolt, we've set it up, we've got a few problems. So an outboard engine needs four things to run. So it needs compression, it needs uh, some way of igniting the fuel, usually through a spark, it needs fuel itself, and it needs air for the fuel to burn. So if we start off by looking at compression issues, what you'll find is that the what's deemed to be a good compression depends on whether the engine is a four-stroke or a two-stroke. And what you find is that a four-stroke engine tends to be a higher compression ratio than a two. What you've got there is, um, the only way to do that is to use a, a compression tester. So what this thing does is you take a, a spark plug out, you screw the adapter in, you turn the engine over, and this measures how much compression is in the engine. If you're down on compression, you've got a number of issues. Um, it's possibly that the engine is worn. You might have broken piston rings, so you lose the compression by that, or it may be that you've put a hole in the piston. The only way to find that out really is going to be to get it in to the shop and get it repaired. So you're looking at head rebuild, um, worst case scenario. So we're okay on uh, compression. So next thing is spark. Check the obvious first. <laughs> Make sure the dead man's cord is attached. If it's not, it will kill the power to the spark system and the engine will work. So spark plugs themselves are not finite, uh, not infinite um, items. They do break down, they do wear out. So you check the color and condition. Uh, the color will depend on the engine itself, but you know what you're looking for is like a biscuity color. Two strokes tend to run a little bit more oily than fours. If you think you've got a problem with the ignition circuit, then use a spark tester. So what the spark tester does is you uncap the high tension lead, you plug this in between the high tension lead and the spark plug, and then when you turn it over. It should show whether or not the uh, the circuit is working. Next one, fuel. <laughs> Again, check the obvious. Is there fuel in it? Is the engine primed? So does the primer bulb go firm when it's squeezed? If it doesn't, then you might have a problem with the non-return valve. So in that case, what you do is you take a non-sparking uh, item, you take the fuel hose off the engine, you gently point it away from you, make sure it's not near any sources of ignition or your eyes or you're not going to pollute with it. You open up the, the non-return valve on the end of the line and check the the, uh, the valve to make sure it's priming, pushing the fuel through. If the engine runs but struggles, Again, check the obvious. Check you haven't got the fuel filler vent closed. You know, a number of times you see guys, they're, they're moping along, they think there's something wrong with it, you look around and the fuel tank's pulling itself flat. So make sure that's open. If it's open, maybe there's dirt or water in the carburetors. If there is, then you've either got to strip them or use cleaning spray and try and drain the moisture out of the, the carburetor bulbs. So, air. What I mean by air is the engine won't turn over. So, first thing again, check the obvious. Check to see that all your fuse is in good order. Then, after that, check the engine's fully in neutral. Um, that is actually my own particular boat, and it has a tendency of looking like it's in neutral, and it's not. So, you think, oh, why won't this start? And then, when you rattle the, the um, remote for the engine, you find out that actually it's in gear. If the engine's in gear, it won't start on the key. So make sure it's in neutral. If the engine turns over slowly, check your battery condition. Again, you can see from this one, that's a battery tester, and it's showing that the battery is undercharged. So if it's low, charge it. If it's okay, Check the terminals are tight and free from corrosion. So maybe get a, a, a wire brush or something on the terminals, make sure they're nice and shiny. 
if you've got any dirt, any corrosion on there, what that's going to do is that's going to introduce a resistance into the loop, and you won't get the full power out of the battery. And if the battery won't hold the charge, then it's time to put the bullet and replace it. Right, so in summary, what have we looked at? We've looked at all types and basic designs. So we've looked at the soft inflatable boat and the rib, and we've looked at comparisons between them. We've looked at DV hull, uh, sorry, deep V hulls versus shallow V hulls, and we've looked at some common engine configurations. So we've looked at uh, outboard versus stern drive versus jet drives, so pros and cons, and basic layouts with them all. We've looked at the outboard engine layout in a little more detail. And we've looked at some of the uh, issues around or well, the differences between two stroke and four stroke and some of the pros and cons. We've looked at setting up the engine. So we've looked at um, actually selecting engine length, prop selection, anodes and offset. And then finally, we looked a little bit at fault finding, so some basic fault finding. Uh, skills to get you through that.